Good evening and welcome to the Spirit of Motorsport TV. And what a show have we got lined up for you this evening. Welcome back. Thanks again for joining us. Please do share. We're going to be on here for at least the next hour. So share it with your friends if they're not tuning in just yet. We will be live for the next hour and you can all get involved in the conversation. This is a live interactive show. So feel free to fire your comments, send over your questions. We have two quite fantastic guests joining us this evening. So feel free to share your questions with them. You can even join us in the studio for future essence. We can set you up in our virtual studio and you can join us and the guests. So this evening we have to celebrate the Classic TT and the Manx Grand Prix, we have the great Roy Moore and the legendary Barry Wood in the studio with us tonight. Welcome, boys. Evening, Haley. Good evening. Hello. Hello. How are we? Not too bad. Excellent. Busy, excellent. Busy day, on the, busy day on the taxi, apparently. So <laughs> glad the lad has been good for him. A few cat naps even there. <laughs> 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 Boys, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on. We've been wanting to get you on for so long after our success with uh, TT with Roy. And we know that you guys have got your fantastic group, which is the uh, Roy Moore and Barry Woods Mountain Memories page on Facebook, which is incredible. And it's just been flying, hasn't it? It's doing all right. Keeping us busy anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it, is. it all started about because we had this uh, thing about having just sitting as we are now maybe not as close, a bit more intimate on a settee, down at the <laughs> golf club, and uh, just talking about our, our lives, really, involved with the bikes. And I've got, a well, more to talk about than Barry, but, but then when Barry joins in, he's got the practical side that he's he's been riding, and also he covers an era where it's a little bit alien to me. So between us, we we seem to have managed to have uh, covered most things in the nearly a year that we've been operating uh, now, 9th of September. And also the fact that we're, that we're not too far away from having 3,000 very loyal fans. And you'll wow. appreciate that, Barry, wouldn't you? That's right. And there's a good hardcore of regular people on as well. And there are people that know what, what they're talking about you know it's one of those groups that you've got to get it right because if you don't it's sort of self-policed and somebody will pull you down straight away and say well that's not right you know so it's uh there's, anybody who's on there is quite knowledgeable which is good you know i mean we can't get the chance to talk to everybody face to face so that's the next best thing and especially the way it's been the last few months it's been uh, kept a lot of people sane i think yeah, now that definitely. it's off mm. Like minded people can get together and chat, compare pictures and stuff like that. So it's, it's gone pretty well, I think. I loved it. I loved it. It's because it pops up on my phone all the time, and to see the interactions, great. But the knowledge that you guys have is is insane. So that you not only get captured by the pictures that you're showing, the photography and the history in our great events from the island, but then the knowledge that you've got to come with it. There's so many times the pictures get posted and. You, people might not be quite sure it is. It just catches their eye. But then your knowledge, Barry and Roy, is like, whoo, following it up with all those knowledge bombs. It's awesome. I think anybody can post a photograph, but if you can post mm. a photograph and a little story with it and a few facts and figures, and it's amazing. The next thing, somebody will come on and say, oh, I was there that day, or my father or grandfather was in that race, and somebody else will chime in. And before long, you can get a full conversation. And it's all genuine. Um got a few more pictures there yet. We can keep going yeah. with it. <laughs> yeah. So this, look at that. It's some of the shots. just off the, And they go back. You, you have a great mixture, don't you, from all the different eras that get thrown in. How Do you have regular contributors or do you tend to find most of it yourselves? Um, well, lots of the photographs that I would post are either maybe lots are taken by me, lots are taken by me mum, lots are from just old books, but there's a whole heap of 1978 ones I've been putting on, which I freely admit the quality is quite dubious. But I was given something like 20,000 little proofs, and they're hard to scan, and they might be dead clear or they might not be, but I just think, well, it's better than nothing, and it, it does bring a few memories back. So 
Um, some are from L books, and occasionally I will credit who took them, but the majority of them are our own, really. And that one particular one on the screen at the moment, that's a proof, you see. Now, it's not the best, but it gives you an idea of what the scrutineering arrangements were like back in the days before the the scrutineering bay was built. Obviously, that's back behind the L grandstand in 1978, and they went into a tent, wheeled the bike up onto a plank, and down the other side. <coughs> and it was, um, it's, it's a lot, maybe it hasn't got the same atmosphere nowadays, but it's a lot more um, civilised, I, I would say. But that's how it was. The only thing with that, of course, the sun is shining here. Mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, would have been, it would have been ironic, Haley, that uh, this night, the Thursday prior to the first practice on the Saturday, I would have been now or have been for all the time that we've lived up here, which is about 45 years, hearing vans turning the corner after coming off the boat and then hearing them changing gear going up past, up to the paddock to get their spot for, the, for where they're going to pitch their tent. And I'd be waiting for me good mate, uh, Alan Bud Jackson, to arrive. Uh, mm -hmm. Whether it was Thursday night, he was more of a Friday early morning man because it was cheaper on the boat. <laughs> but uh, but it, it would be all the boys would be going up past and they got to know you and they give you the thumbs up and then you got to know them. And it wouldn't have been the best weather tonight for that, uh, having for them having to go up and then get lined up and pitch a tent in, in the damp conditions. But uh, certainly... When it says Roy and Barry's Mountain Memories, uh, I can go back, like, talking about Grand Prix well, well before anything was mentioned about Classic. The Manx Grand Prix in the early days were the Classic bikes that they're racing now, the Nortons, the AGS, the Matchless. And, uh, you know, you, you would be taken down to what they call the weigh-in for the Manx Grand Prix with your mother and in the, the railings there at Farragas and Ashton's down in in Westmoreland Road and you'd see the boys and the riders all come up and weigh their bikes in and the next morning you'd be up there and they'd be firing them up and taking them on a little bit of a parade down Hill Street and down Finch Road onto the promenade along. Sometimes they go they go up to the chip shop up by Corkle's Garage but more often than not they go up Summer Hill and up Blackberry Lane and people say well why did they do that? And it was part and part of the past part of parcel of the history of the Manx Grand Prix that all the bikes were air cooled and had solid oil when they started up and that oil had to be fluent and, and at a proper temperature before they could even contemplate about racing and even Barry remembers that part of the of the, the procedure because uh, it's it's not all that long ago that it stopped no I I, rec I helped a friend of mine in 1986 Manx, and they did it that no, they did it in '85, but by '88, when I first did it, they hadn't done it. So within that couple of years, it ceased. And um, I would I do have done it once myself, just to say I'd done it. But having said that, it wasn't that popular with the two-stroke men, really, was it? No, that's mm. what happened. You see, when when you had the air-cooled engines, they had to get hot, and then. But now you you see the boys in in the park for me, or the posh word for it, I think, where they all collect before. The mechanic comes along, water-cooled engines, even later on when the Yamahas came along with the water cooling and all that. They didn't have a button to press to start them. They still had to run alongside them and mm. jump aboard. But now it's, it's, it's very, very rare that you get a situation whereby the machines aren't warming up on the stands. But then when the, when the two strokes came along, I can well remember that because the Jackson family were out in the garage and Bob and Bud would be making mm -hmm. their way down to pick their bike up. And they said it was a nightmare because they altered the route. Instead of going down along the prom, uh, I think they were still doing it at that time, by the way. They just started doing the promenade about 1984, but mm -hmm. <laughs> tongue in cheek. But they then went along to Quarterbridge and up Bray Hill. So trying to keep a two stroke happy, as Barry will know. Very hard work on the clutch. Yeah. So a lot of the two stroke men didn't didn't particularly like doing that parade and gaining the clutch when they had a four lap race coming up. Mm -hmm. So there was more than one pretending he had a problem and got a lift up in the breakdown van to conserve his clutch. <laughs> um, and that was 
a thing that it, it died out. Even in the years after that, they had a thing where you had at the start of the Manx Grand Prix race day, you had to push your bike to your pit in front of the grandstand. And I had to do this a few times. And it was all part of the old pomp and splendor of the Manx and the, the gladiators lining up in front of the crowds sort of thing. I must admit there was a, a one tradition I was glad to see done away with because you were a bag of nerves anyway. So you had to push your pit, then you had to push right up the road and back to the start line. So that ceased about 92, would you say, Roy, something like that? Yeah, probably would be round mm. about that. Another thing that people say about is round the bins. And there's loads of uh, footage, even No Limit, with George Formby. He went round the bins and basically, again, for the same reason, in TT week, uh, they didn't have the parade. They weighed the bikes into a tent and kept them overnight. And then they had to fire them up the next morning, whether it be a four-cylinder Jalera or an MV or a single-cylinder Norton, had the same problem. So what they did, they borrowed dustbins off the corporation and put them all down the centre of Glen Crutchery Road, right down through to Governor's Bridge. And my Uncle Jack was the flag marshal down at Governor's Bridge, and he was the turning point. So what they would do, once they were fired up, they would then go down one side to Governor's Bridge, go around Uncle Jack, and then come back down to the start-finish and do it as many times as they felt was sufficient to uh, to do, get that oil warm. So mm. that's another kind of part. The Grand Prix didn't do that, not to my knowledge. They had their parade lap or parade parade, whereas the TT went round the bins and many of the bikes that have been dragged up Greenfield Road up towards the filtration plant there and had to be bump started on the on the downhill section to get them get That's them right. fired up. Mm. Uh, all part of the TT history, like mm. well, the atmosphere at the way and fantastic. We oh. used we used to go down on the bus yeah. from Wilson, walk through Princess Street. And the little wall is still there on the old Mulcrease garage. And, uh, you know, it was a, a brilliant place to get autographs. And then, of course, they go in and you see the bike. At the end of the night, you can see all the bikes, maybe 100 bikes lined up side by side in the garage showroom. And then the next morning, the riders collected them and rolled them up in this parade. And there's some photographs from back in the 30s as well when they went to the Brown Bobby, came back down into town now down Peel Road. All those houses there were guest houses at the time. And it's got all the staff standing outside with the old black and white catering clothes on and stuff and the, the chambermaids watching the bikes going through a, a great event. So glad I remembered it. I'm glad I got lots of the autographs down there. I'm right. not surprised you was there. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't so boys, I, I couldn't think of two better gentlemen than to be honouring what would have been the the fortnight, wouldn't it? Starting Saturday the 22nd till the 4th of September, and it would have been the Classic and the Manx Grand Prix. And what a bloody shame that it's not happening like the TT didn't. So all we can do is the best best thing that we can do is bring you boys on here, and I'm so grateful to do that and share your memories and the stories, et cetera. And we've got so many comments that people are excited that you're on here. I'm just going to share some of it with you. So we've got Alan Lane, hello from Gloucestershire, missing this year's visit to the island. Um, uh, Richard Davies has just joined Mountain Memories, fantastic. Um, Philip Fire, Fireblade Phil Nelms, <laughs> can you ask Barry um, why he started racing, please? Ooh. Well, the, the, the answer to this is probably the answer to most people who started racing. I got banned from driving. And it was something to do with drink driving. I never did that. But many years ago, late at night, um, late on a Friday night of February, I was clocked at a very high speed on my road bike over by the Crescent pub, and I got banned. And um, I was going to race anyway. It, just, it was the right time to do things. And I think it was better for the, the good people, the Douglas and the Iron Man in general, that I <laughs> got off the roads and uh, a bike came up for sale, uh, early TZ250, with a drum brake, a right foot gear change, and I had a Max M3 tank on it, a big six-gallon tank, which I didn't really realise the um, significance of that. But then once I started racing, I made a lot of friends all of a sudden. 
regular Manx Grand Prix men asking about the tank. And then I realized they all did the junior Manx, so they wanted to use my big tank uh, for, for the Manx. So I thought I could do all right out of this. But I didn't drive at the time, even. Obviously, I was banned. You were banned? Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I was all right then, but I, I couldn't drive and I had no road bike. So I, so there was various offers made, and a, a lad called Peter Hounsel came up with the best offer. And he had a gorgeous TZ tank with like pale blue, the speed block design, like the Kenny Roberts design. He said, You can put this in your bike the rest of the year, and I'll give you a lift up to every single Jeremy meeting for the rest of the year. So that's that was a, a good cue. That I don't know where that tank ever went, though. But it just happened to be on the bike the time. But that's why I, I, I started racing. I was always going to start racing, but it was the time. I was 20 then. Looking back, I should have done it years before that, but it's all money and decisions, you know, and uh, history. Well, it is. Well, if I can ask Aid, our producer, to bring up our, our show picture, if that's okay. Um, I just want to refer back to that. It's a tremendous picture of you, Barry. What year is it? What uh, oh, we can bring up the promo picture that we've got. You look very slick in it. <laughs> I wish I was still that way. <laughs> there you are. Check him out. There Which what with this one here? Yeah. What what year is that? This was nineteen ninety four. Nineteen ninety four. Yeah. Okay. Great. Six ten hundred in, in in Ireland. Those letters. If you look closely, you've got about six or eight different patches on them from accidents, but. They are still alive in a collection. A good friend of mine in Belfast has got them hanging up. And there's some, I, I can't believe they're still there, but they, they are, but they have a few stories to tell. But that was 94. That's when I had my own colour hair as well. <laughs> I thought I had hair anyway, any colour. We, oh. we used to do a lot of Irish road races, and that was always the first one of the season. Hard to get, though, because there was no boats back in those days. You had to go to, it was, it was the end of April. The Belfast boat didn't start till the TT time, so you had to go to Haitian, drive up to Stranra, and then Stranra to Lan, and then another drive late at night. And it was a one-day event. It wasn't like now where you had to be there for practice on Friday. It was open on the on the on the Saturday, so it was there was a bus for around with newcomers, and then there was um, two laps practice for newcomers, and then two laps for everybody else, and then you raced, and it was a six and a half mile. Course. I went over in the winter time to learn it. So, what I always did, this Cook 700 nowadays is a different course. And it's not a patch on the old one. Mm -hmm. that was, that was yeah. That's what you would have been doing, though, Barry, wouldn't it? I mean, I mean, like come Saturday night or this coming Saturday night would have been the boys. But prior to that, you would have been involved in taking newcomers round. You took my lad round, Peter. And I sat in in the back and was was absolutely mesmerised by. I've been round with quite a few, but uh, some of your descriptions of where to be safely, bearing in mind that they're newcomers. So you've missed a year of doing that, and I I genuinely feel as though you you really enjoyed helping people out. I did enjoy it, but the day I realised that you were going to jump in the back seat, <laughs> I was absolutely bag of nerves. Don't say the wrong thing. Yeah, this is Roy's young <laughs> Right. Well, in fairness, Roy didn't say a word at all till we got back. I think you were a bit gobsmacked by it all, weren't you, Roy? Yeah. And then we, when Peter got out, we chatted for about an hour about it then. Over but, a uh, pint. Over a pint, yes. Yeah. Whenever yeah. possible. But um, no, this would have been the, the big weekend of it all happened, certainly. And we're all a bit uh, stuck out of water, shall we? It's a bloody shame, isn't it? Um, I'm just going to share some more comments with you boys, if that's okay. John Kaszewski has commented a couple of times. He's just recovering from his big off, and he's doing well, apparently. Um, so all the best to you, John. Uh, is it just me, or how could you not learn from these two gems? Thank you to Roy and Barry. Love that. Love it. Roy, I've also got a, <laughs> I've got a, a question for you from Baza B. Evening, Roy. What part of road racing have you missed the most with this COVID cancelling everything this year? The bit that I always miss every year, uh, irrespective of what you're, uh, you know, uh, allocated to do, uh, will be the next fortnight. The whole atmosphere of the Manx Grand Prix, uh, the classic is something that's happened uh, off late. It's an awful lot different than when it first happened. 
because as Barry will explain with years and times and all that, Classic Racing and the Manx Grand Prix was a, a separate event, but it was combined with the Manx Grand Prix. Mm -hmm. So you had the best of both worlds, worlds really. Uh, you had all your memories of like 1954 going down to Farragut's Nations with my mother and seeing local heroes Derek Ennett and, and George Gustain, and that was the year that they both won. And yeah, that that will stay with me. Been a sad loss that was being announced yesterday of a local rider called Dennis Christian, uh, who again was part of the history. There's a photograph of all the Manxies who were taken part. And Derek Ennett was amongst them, Bob Mawson and Don Crossley and all, all kinds of different people that were involved. And that, that photograph now, I think, is down to just one survivor. So it was a bit sad on that, but that was your memories. But I always had a, a, a kind of an affection for the Grand Prix. It might have been the fact that we saw the parade. But basically... Uh, you had all these people coming over who came over for the excitement and the enjoyment of racing. And they just took over little garages here, there and everywhere. There wasn't any park fermies and, and motor homes or anything like that. They stayed in boarding houses in Domain Road, in my instance, because we were living above Ernest Kelly's shop in Prospect Terrace. And you'd stick your head round and you, you found out their names and then you looked out for them. And they might have been finishing 45th, but it didn't bother you. You were looking for that number that they were coming towards you in various places. More often than not, it was up round uh, Glen Crutchery Road because we were living in Park Avenue in the early days, and that was the easiest place to see them. Why would you want to travel? You couldn't to start with, but why would you want to travel when you could just virtually hang out at the front of Hotchkiss's nurseries and see all the action going on? So I have a genuine affection for the Manx Grand Prix. It's combined with the classic now, and uh, people have got their own opinions on that. But by the same token, it's uh, I'm going to miss the Grand Prix. Whether Peter would have been racing, that would have put a bit of pressure on, mm. uh, obviously, because it does. You, you can't get away from that. It's a it's a fact of life. But certainly, uh, yeah, I just I just. I'm an absolute out-and-out -out Manx Grand Prix fan, full mm. stop. He, he couldn't agree more with that. It was, it was the same for us. It was always the last thing before going back to school after the summer holidays. It was just a nice time of year. Um, I think that because the riders were not the top TT men, they were normal people who raced. And I can always remember as, as a, a little boy, it was 1970, sitting on the hedge of Bedstead, and the first two riders came around, sign pulls from my mum says, put her feet back over the hedges. She says, well, I don't trust these fellas like the June fellas. And I didn't really understand that till later on, but they were enthusiastic amateurs, all of good riders. Um, different sort of a crowd as well. I, I, I think the Max Grand Prix crowd are, are maybe more, more knowledgeable about things, whereas at, at the TT there were people here maybe for the, the drinking uh, and, and the road bikes sort of thing. Um, I, I certainly miss it for the, ho the whole ethos of the Manx Grand Prix, the, the whole routine, the people coming in, like Roy says, people coming into the paddock. I would be down every night on my push bike as, as a young fella to see who'd arrive first. And you got to sort of know these people over the years. Um, and then later on, myself being involved, the, the signing on people you hadn't seen for a year. There's a different close camaraderie to the TT. And and as Roy also says, lots of people stayed in the garages. We had people staying in our shed right from 1978 onwards. And <clears throat> garages after that up near me. Just a way of life. Um, sad time. Mm -hmm. Well, boys, we've got so much interesting questions for you. So I'm going to share a couple more before we, we keep chatting. We've got um, John Kosciuszewski is asking you, who would be fastest in a one-lap race? <laughs> well, probably Roy, because cause he's got the phaser part right side and I haven't got a bike at all. I'll be in the taxi. And I have a license to look after these days, John Kosciuszewski. You still ban, Barry? <laughs> no, but I have to keep the speed moving now. <laughs> Yeah. That's a revelation to get us together sat here. 
we've been kind of buzzing buddies for a year and all that, and I didn't know he was a jailbird. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite that. <laughs> yeah, a hooligan. He was, he was one of the Manx hooligans. You don't talk about these things, you know. Yeah, but it's lovely but, to lovely to hear it. But there's lots of these top riders, lots of books I've read, and they all got into race and when they lost their license. Is that a fact? Is it? it is. Yeah, it all that check that, on that, that lots of times. Huh? Um, just that I'm, I don't mind telling you that. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing. Yeah. There are stories um, which uh, abound about uh, very famous racers who have been uh, part of the, the law over here or had to be talk and talked to by the law over here. And uh, certainly that's not for kind of talking about in this kind of situation, but there'll be a lot of people now nodding, nodding their heads and saying, <laughs> oh, I, oh, I remember the time such and such a body was out doing a little bit of illegal practising and crashed and uh, the police were informed and the next thing... Uh, this gentleman was uh, formed, and yeah, there's there's quite a few stories, Barry. Well, then didn't the great Tom Heron get? He was up in front of the high bailiff during TT weekend. He got fined, whatever it was, and he said to the high bailiff, "You should have called me yesterday. I was in 160 <laughs> at the same spot." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true story. <laughs> Brilliant, brilliant. So everyone remembered to do send your questions over. Thank you for your comments. And if you do, if anything pops up with anything that we're talking about, please feel free to share your questions. So boys, I want to come back to, because um, it's obviously well known the Manx Grand Prix to be an amateur um, festival now. It's a festival, Is how is it defined as a motorcycle festival, a classic motorcycle festival? Is that what they define it as now? The full title? Well, to be honest with you, they had this name, the Festival of Motorcycling, on it, but that's mm -hmm. been dropped. That's mm. like the whole next radio still refer to that. It doesn't officially mm. anymore. Mm. Uh, being old school, I referred to the whole lot of it as the Manx Grand Prix. Yeah, I have to say that, although it's classic TT to me, it's it's the Manx, and it always will be. The whole four night is the Manx, um, and I won't be able to change from that. Um, I, I too have seen the classic Manx Grand Prix in its well, ever since it was introduced, and some great times. So great massive fields in the early days of that as well, where the numbers went well up into the hundreds, hundred and tens. Um, I don't know what the future holds. I think there was about twenty six on the grid for the senior classic TT last year. So there would have been more than that. So I don't know what's going to happen. But um, still a great thing. But you know. Early days, you had uh, like John Goodall and the Swallows, and and yeah, you could reel them off the top of your head. All the different people that had, and the, probably the majority of them owned their own bikes. An awful lot of the riders who now compete uh, get offered uh, bikes to ride, which are part and parcel of teams, well-known teams as well. So you know, coming moving from the from those early days where, again, with, with the, the two races run consecutively on the day, they would have a classic in the morning and then a Manx Grand Prix in the afternoon. There is a big divide, to be fair, and uh, it's it's hyped up. We might finish up in Castle Russian with our views on this, but <laughs> by, the same, by the same token, it's got to be somebody's got to say it, haven't they? Or if you don't have a belief in uh, what you think is right, well, then... Uh, I could never see why they went away from that because the Manx Grand Prix is providing maybe 10 mile an hour slower than the top men. But what classic racing that they had, well, that's not the term to use either, but what racing on the course have they had? Michael Evans and Nathan Harrison and all the one-off winners from the newcomers and all that. Go back through the records of the Manx Grand Prix okay. newcomers and see all the, the people that have passed through there over the years and where they came to and then progressed to the TT and, and away. So mm. it's part and parcel of it. And uh, maybe, yeah, I don't think I don't think there is any negotiation for going back to the old days where the Manx Grand Prix and the Classic uh, are integrated because it does seem a cut-off point that on the bank holiday Monday after that, uh, you're kind of left to your own devices and then you've got to uh, get the newcomers in on the Monday and then the two races on the, the Wednesday and then two on the Friday. And if there's ever a better presentation 
TT presentations used to be renowned. It filled the Villa Marina Gardens with enthusiasts going to cheer on Aylward and all the winners of the of the particular time. Now it's not unknown that some of them don't even bother turning up because their money is assured. The glory of winning is not it is incidental, really. It's 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 their business, and they run it as a business, and they don't have to go. They'll still get their checks sent through the post. But go to a Manx Grand Prix presentation where you've got all the families who have completed or competed over the weeks <coughs> and completed the two weeks and the, the relief of the families, they can let themselves go. Villa Marina are absolutely packed and everybody receives the, the credit that they deserve, whether they, finish, made out of the year. Yeah, whether they finish 57th or they're getting in the chair to go to the stage. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful presentation night. And mm. certainly I've been delighted to be involved with it over the last 10, 12 years since Jeff Cannell uh, tragically lost it. Jeff in 2007. I think we stepped in from 2008 onwards and some of the best nights mm -mm. in motorcycling uh, that you could would wish to have. Well, I actually brought people there last year for the first time. People who've been at the Manx for years but never bothered going to the presentation. We had a few mm. drinks. And Webs says, Come on, go over, come with us. And they said we would never miss it in the future. They had no mm -hmm. idea of the atmosphere and the camaraderie. And then the crack goes somewhere else after that. But it's a great night. And you mm -hmm. go through a lot of too, don't you? There's all the special awards. Yeah, there's the through. awards to go through. And some awards aren't won and they're put back in their box and go back up to G4S. But uh, certainly mm -hmm. they organize it well. And, and it's, a, it's a way of showing appreciation. And then welcome them back next year. Uh, unfortunately, 2020, that's not going to happen. And uh, I'm getting even more depressed now with the weather. Right? <laughs> <laughs> alongside me. <laughs> well, I look forward to joining you boys for a pint of bushies next year at the uh, at the evening. Definitely heading there with you too. Um, so I just want to go back to the entry, what it takes for, because it was originally the Manx Amateur Road Races, right? And it moved into the Manx Grand Prix. And the what you needed, the level at which you were racing at, depending on whether you could actually enter into it. So if you could just, how is that stand now? Because the names we still get coming over and racing and shining a light on the event and just taking away the trophies are insane. Um, so how does how is that defined now for the racers and, and whether they're going to enter into it or not? And why would they too? Well, if, it, if you're talking mm -hmm. classic TT, it's basically your TT entry, but anybody else can, can do that who has mm -hmm. a national race license. If you talk a Manx Grand Prix, it's it's uh, not not for international riders, but there's a rule now, I think, after, if you've done the, done the TT a couple of years, you can go back to the Manx after a certain period of time. Everything changed in the last few years, so what was set in stone for a long time and you knew where you were with things, now you don't necessarily. I do know. Several friends of mine who went on to the TT have gone back to the Manx and are a lot happier at the Manx. There's not so much pressure on there. Um, the, 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 the leading riders in the Manx are the potential winners. Unless you were into the Manx Grand Prix or, or road racing generally, lots of people may not even be familiar with those names. But they, lots of them as well are doing the Manx as a step up to the TT. I mean, in the last few years, people like Raul Torres, the Spanish rider, yeah. Julian Trummer, Mike Norbury, they've all done the Manx first, moved on to the TT and given it a great account of themselves, which I think is the exact right way to do things. Um, there were some past newcomers planning to do the Manx this mm -hmm. year. I really look forward to seeing how they would go on, not just in the, in the newcomers race, but in the Manx Grand Prix itself. Now, whether or not we, next year they will still be in a position to do that because it's another year down the line, things can change. They may have a new sponsor who may not, the Max Sampri may not figure in his plans, or they might think, well, we're a year older, we'll crack on with the TT. But yeah. certainly, I think it's the best way. And it, there's a, a, another rider there, was he third or fourth last year, Francesco Curinga. Yeah. Had a great ride. But he's he's um, learned it the right way. He will go on to the TT and be up there, I'm sure. 
There was a French winner, wasn't there? Yves Saint Bain won the he won, he won the newcomers race, yeah. yeah. So I mean, done it exactly right. So if he goes on the TT, he's going to be probably immediately be in the top fifteen, and no pressure of being a TT newcomer, which is considerable. I, I would suggest it was a lot easier when you were riding very wood. I never got, I never got, I never got uh, tangled up with the name Wood. I could get <laughs> the dead man that one very easy. And Danny Wood on his way to another victory. How many did you know, three? Oh, two, 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 two. Well, people call you Wood. People say, Oh, I actually heard of a fellow last week in the taxi. He's still be father's called Barry Woods. <laughs> and I grew up on the Isle of Man. I don't know who's he, you know. So there's two of us around. But there is. I know him actually. I think he lives in Ramsey. <laughs> I do. I do. And uh, he still heard of you. Everybody used to say to his father years ago, How are you doing now after your accident? And he said, I haven't had an accident. <laughs> Yes, you were in hospital for weeks. There's a, there's a Roy, yeah. there's a Roy Moore, a painter and decorator on the Isle of Man. Yeah. We had a phone call to the house one night where this woman, elderly woman, ran up and said to my wife, "Can you tell Roy to come round and do what he did for me the last time? He paid me a visit." <laughs> and I used to do discos, and whenever we used to meet the other Roy Moore and this Roy Moore, he'd say, "Now the discos going, you sir?" I'd say to him. <laughs> And he was saying, you're doing much painting and decorating at the moment. <laughs> we played in the book. We were both down there at Roy Moore. <laughs> um, so, guys, I'm just going to uh, share a couple more comments. We do have a couple of questions here as well. So we've got um, – everybody's loving you, seeing you on here. Uh, Ian Kermo says, ask Barry about classic lightweight races, 99 and 2000. Uh, they were great years for me as I was in the pits for both years – Oh, okay. Yeah, she's a friend of mine from Ramsey. Mm -hmm. And the, the bike I rode those years was a, a belonged to Dickie Watson, who was a Ramsey man. So um, good times. I mean, everybody starts racing with the ambition to, or amongst people, to win a race on the TT course. So to, to do that once and to do it twice is, is a, a wonderful feeling. So mm. that was those years. All of a sudden, it's 20 years ago. I don't know where the time went to. Mm. We can't even celebrate this year. <laughs> you know, oh. you know, he was in the pits and he was always, if we went to Ireland racing, he would always be one of the lads who came with us. Only a small group of us. There wasn't any big click. You know, we didn't walk around with shirts with our names on or anything like that. We were just jeans and t shirt fellas. But um, quite a few of the Ramsey lads. And I still get to Ramsey now and have a, have a drink and chat with them when I can. But um, no, good, good times. But could never be beaten now. That was the, the high point of my life, probably. <laughs> Whatever the Manx race, but it's it's all memories, isn't it? Yeah, mm -hmm. memories are good though, isn't it? And you're you're well remembered for that. And I believe you were in the uh, in the Ramsey area uh, last Saturday night and led to believe and Peel. We were in the Castle Lane <laughs> Peel and Ramsey areas last Saturday night. <laughs> hey, hey. Round the sorrows. Sounds great. Um, and we've got uh, Barry, another one, for, well, for both of you, actually. Paul Aggie Arthur says, evening, legends. Barry, what is the best road race you've witnessed? And same question to Roy, Klinkerhoff and more. <laughs> Klinkerhoff and <laughs> DMA. Yeah, well, I don't know. We've, you've got to be realistic if you're 73 years of age, Manx born and bred. And if you do get a situation where you're involved, uh, you can't you can't control your enthusiasm for for what's happening in front of you. Uh, we've we've been kind of uh, lucky, really, I suppose. I mean, there's an awful lot of people out there with knowledge and stuff like that. But to be asked to do that way back in 1983, there was a chap called Charlie Webster from Manx Radio give me me chance. Uh, to be fair, Jeff Cannell had never even considered. Uh, asking his cousin whether he, he wanted to do it, but we got involved and we've 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 seen a few races. But I tend to get a little bit over enthusiastic if Manx people are involved at the at the end, and and uh, it it was commented upon last year in the Manx Grand Prix with Nathan Harrison. But then when you stop and think of all the, the lad, what that lad had gone through after his accident and his road to recovery, where there was a lot of people <laughs> about him, but then he came back and got into a position where he did the double, and it wasn't looking likely in the second race. 
and we did have the the privilege of listening to the, the to the the broadcast we don't do it normally but uh, it just happened to crop up the other day and uh, me screaming like a lunatic at Ramsey Head and when he was back to only three seconds behind and then screaming even more like a lunatic when he was going two ahead at the bungalow but the one we always go back to uh, apart from that one now which possibly i would say has superseded the the the, the hickman uh, harrison battle which was very very similar mm. they had a thing in the past when certain people were involved that the bungalow was their commentary and you had to hand back for them and then uh, this gentleman left uh, through situation which occurred, not through any fault of his own. And we sat down and we said, well, what's the point in going back to the grandstand early? Why can't Ramsey Hairpin handle the bungalow? And that has been the case of, uh, of late, you'll notice. And then we give them plenty of time. They'll probably be round Craig Nabar held and going down Hillbury to get the crunk pneumonia and then the, the, the build up at the grandstand. But the classic race that we were involved in has got to be the Dean Harrison, Peter Hickman, where again, very similar to the Harrison <coughs> battle uh, in the Manx Grand Prix, he was three to four seconds behind, but it was known that he was climbing the mountain quicker than Dean Harrison. And then the commentator at Ramsey screaming like a lunatic, he's point eight ahead. <laughs> and uh, yeah, going then and sitting down in a darkened room. But if you don't get excited <laughs> about about it, you might as well pack in. And oh, it's absolutely. A bit like yeah. sex. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, on regard to that question, do Aggie, um, I know every, most people say mm. seven diamonds, senior. I'm too young to remember that. Oh, that would have been one of my top three. The Halewood and when Havel won the Formula One in 78, obviously would have been a magical one. But my choice, which I always say when I'm asked this question, was not a particularly spectacular race, but it was just the way it happened, the 1971 Junior TT. And the reason it was so interesting was that Agostini was a foregone conclusion to win that race, and he'd won the double in 68, 69, and 70. So basically the race was for second place. And we were at Bedstead, of course, where I always, always watched at Bedstead. And I always remember on the first lap, Agassini retired in Ramsey with the MV, which is unheard of because he rarely broke down. In fact, I think that's about the only time it ever did break down yeah, on, it was, on the yeah. Isle of Man. Yeah. And a massive cheer went up all around the course. So that wasn't a, an Andy Agostini cheer. It was because all of a sudden there was a race on and you had various riders dicing for the lead, various riders led it. A few couple came off. Um, I, I think Phil Reed was at the sharp end. He had some problems uh, that day. Rod Gould led it. He came off at Quarterbridge. Alan yeah, Barnett yeah. was up there. He came off at Glen Helen. And then um, there, was, there was Gordon Pantle. Gordon Pantle had moved on from the Manx Grand Prix. He tried for years to win the Manx. Never quite won it. So he came into the TT. He was lying in second place, but he had trouble at Braddon Bridge on the first lap, dropped the bike, had to, I think it was, I think it was first lap, had to rip the screen off and carry on. So he was catching up. And then on the fifth lap, a, a rider called Dudley Robinson, little heard of, although he was on a pageant Yamaha, Dudley Robinson took over leading the race. And people were going, who, who is he? You know, And he was coming in for a surprise victory, a popular victory. And he come off on the last lap out by the extra de Ren Cullen. So the race eventually was won by Tony Jeffries, which is Nick's brother. And uh, Tony had won his first TT on the Saturday night, which is the inaugural Formula 750 race. It was a three-lap race. But the Mondays was on a Yamsel. Gordon Pample got second in that race. And that was, to me, the most exciting and fascinating TT race I ever seen. Not many people would mention that race, but uh, and I was only seven, but I was old enough to understand exactly how it worked. Mm. And the fact that Agle, because don't forget, it was still World Championship points at that time. Agle needed those points. Some of the lesser riders getting points didn't really care if they got points or not. It was just another race. They'd have been happy with a few quid in the prize fund to maybe pay the boat home or some, buy some new tyres. But 71 Junior TT for me. Wow. 
felt like I was there with you then, Barry. That's great. I <laughs> love that. Love it. Um, okay, so uh, we've got lots of comments, but I do want to come back. So there's so many. We touched on the newcomers, and obviously a lot of people use it as a platform to, to gear themselves up for the TT and get their stripes, et cetera. Now, the newcomers and the names that we've seen come through the paddock over the years have just been incredible haven't they so i want to go back and start with hizzy so steve hislop in 1983 he won he won the newcomer then didn't he did he win that lightweight is that right he was second wasn't he, he was second was he the, second the the, the 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 junior newcomers race that the top three in it was robert dunlop steve hislop being Lockett, Liam Lockett yeah. and it was one of the greatest top threes ever in the history of the manx and pre newcomers mm. and i mean i never bothered to count the review count at all how many TTs those three riders won between them? It'd be quite mind-boggling. Mm. You know what? What better proof could you get? The, the newcomer Saint Prix is the ideal way up mm. to the team. Going back quite a number of years prior to that, they they were conscious of it. There was only uh, two classes in the Manx Grand Prix. You either rode the junior or the senior. Uh, the lightweight came in later on, 63, 64, 64, yeah. 64 with, with uh, Gordon Keith winning it. But they had tried uh, for a couple of years newcomers races. They were known as the newcomers. But they also tried races called the Snaefell races. And one of the men who was involved in that that uh, went on to do quite well, and he won it, I think it was the junior, the senior uh, Snaefell race, was Phil Reed. So he came in as a 19-year-old to ride in the Grand Prix and uh, his career took him then to numerous TT wins. But it was when Rob Brew, another Manxman, won the, the first of the newcomers' races. What year was that, Barry? That was 78 and it was uh, very heavy rain thickness. It wouldn't happen these days, Roy Wood. He had glasses on and he got over the mountain quicker than anybody else. I think it was Con Law or somebody that was behind him, wasn't it? And he's seen them off. Uh, Rob Brew. But then Conor from, McGinn was Conor McGinn behind, it yeah. was, yeah. From that uh, from that point on, Conor McGinn, uh, Conor Cummins was named after Conor McGinn. He was one of uh, Billy Cummins' favourite riders. So that's another piece of useless information. <laughs> but at the same time, uh, the, the newcomers' races from that point on are, are just kept on producing uh, new. And, and there's a, there was a man who came through, uh, Hind, what was his first name, that came through this year? Well, James, James, James Hind. Hind. Uh, Hind. Jim, Jimmy, he, uh, what a disappointment not to see how he would have uh, coped with whatever he did if he came back to the island uh, for the TT or the Manx Grand Prix. I was going to say, this, this is the thing, we, we don't know who would have been doing the Manx. No, that's mm. there was no you, entry. You know that well. There lots of these riders over the winter time made the decision to move on. So you might say, well, I reckon Victor Lopez would have won the six fifty races this year easily. But for all I know, Victor may not even have been in the Manx. We will never know now. <laughs> this mm. is a sad thing. Mm. Friendy will be a blank. Yeah, Ian Hutchinson, another top man who yeah, won the newcomers, top man in the and that was a surprise yeah. when he came from behind that day. Do you remember that? He, uh, he was he was number twenty three, I think, in the race. But so, although he was leading it, he was way back on the roads, and it was just in the last lap he'd done one hundred and sixteen on a standard bike, mm. and people never heard of him. Then, of course, went to the TT and blah blah blah. Philip McCallum, the new, he won my newcomers race. Philip McCallum, the one um, that you were in, the one I was in, yeah. and, and one of the most silliest things I ever did in my life was on the starting line. I was seventy three. Philip McCallum was number seventy six. And for some reason, in the last 20 seconds, I turned around and looked behind me, and I just seen his eyes like this. You know, if there was ever a moment where you thought to yourself, what the hell am I doing here? It was then, because mm -hmm. I knew he was right behind me. And it was the same on the Friday. We were the same numbers for the lightweight race on the Friday. Mm -hmm. I didn't look back that time. Mm -hmm. But on the Friday, he was on it by then, and he passed me before the quarter bridge. And then he won both the races with lap and race records, I think. And then he went on to the TT the next year. That was a year Joey got injured at Brands Hatch. Remember that? Yeah. 89. Yeah. And, and yeah. Philip Formula was off at Joey's 250. And he gave a good account of himself. And then the rest was history after that. But it all started at the, at the, yeah, the Manx Grand Prix. Yeah. Yeah. Mike Corris's garage up in Annika. He did. Yeah. <laughs> he did very well. 
Uh, so, boys, I'm just going to share some more comments. You've got <laughs> so many fans, obviously. We've got um, Bazzi B is, is sharing a few comments. He says, it's a pleasure to listen to Roy and Barry. Get the feeling of sat chatting over a pint. Not sure about inviting Haley. Seems to be a bit of a wild child. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know whether we can trust around alcohol. Wow, look at his face. The angel in me, of course. Carlos. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've got Gail Kaur says, what are your memories of the Bryant Atkinson finish in 06? I remember being at the Gooseneck and nearly hadn't, um, <laughs> hadn't a blade of hair left. <laughs> yeah, Derek Bryan and Craig yeah. and uh, when they used to start in pairs, and again, yeah. it's another thing that you see. They started if somebody who's new to the to the TT or new to the Grand Prix. They started in pairs, what well, two of them together? Oh yes, and then they pushed off, and then somebody said it wasn't uh, it wasn't safe. But you had situations. Neil Kent, Dan Sale, Craig, uh, Derek Bryan, and Craig Atkinson. And uh, who was the other one? Oh, Bill Swallow, uh, Bill Swallow, and Bob Heath, mm. starting one and two, or two and three, uh, three and four, and and going round. And it was first over the line would would win it. <coughs> and my young fellow was uh, down. Maybe that's what gave him the inclination to go racing. But we were down at Ramsey Hairpin, and it was the uh, I think it was the Bill Swallow, uh, Bob Heath battle. That was going on there and it was bob heath who was ahead but it was going to be first over the line who was going to win and uh you tend to lose it and then you, you tune in hoping that the excitement of it all would be picked up by by others in and around the grandstand and that certainly was and the photographs are there to to, to justify it as well fractions I think it was Dan Sale and Neil Kent. He beat uh, Dan Sale just oh, beat there's been a few Neil like Kent. There's been a few yeah. as well. Yeah, Fractions. That, that particular race that Gail's yeah. talked about, I can remember it for all the wrong reasons. I had been in the classic race and broke down out on the big of my eagle and I had no money, I had no phone, I had no anything. So I watched the race, but I couldn't, didn't even have a radio, didn't have a wireless. And there were some people next to me arrived and I thought, great, and I heard a lap. Then they picked the wireless up and disappeared. So I wasn't even sure who had won. It was that close on the road you couldn't tell. Mm. And I couldn't uh, couldn't find anybody who could tell me. So it was a long time later when I see, when I eventually got home, we we found out where it was. But of course there was there was a video, I think, still from that year. And it was uh, a lot of footage at the time. I knew Derek well, actually. I knew Derek Brian. And uh, I was hoping he would have won it, and he, well, he, he did eventually win it, didn't he? he? He did win the match. Yeah, he did, yeah, yeah, yeah but not on that particular, not on that particular occasion. One. Yeah, no, well, Brown. Craig was on Martin Bullock's bike, wasn't he, on, on that occasion, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it seems strange, too, also, that you, you can get all the up-to-date information now, can you? Even, mm. you know, the wrong information, the wrong, the wrong kind of information which has been put out. With those of uh, of a certain age, like me, mm -hmm. the only thing you could find out really what had gone on was reading the TT special afterwards. They would put it all together with a few photographs and it would come out at about seven o'clock, half past seven after a two and a half hour race. And I remember in 62, I think it was, when Hocking and Halewood were fighting and the tragic loss of Tom Phyllis on that occasion, and we only found out when we came off the mountain and back down to restock to go back up on the mm -hmm. Wednesday. Manx Radio and thing is, and the BBC would never publish anything, but certainly you've got it for a for a timed event. Now you can mm -hmm. generate the excitement off a timed event, really right down to the the coming out of the the, the dip at Governors Bridge and they're heading down uh, Glen Crutchy Road, and who's won? And away you go, but it, it, it's not always been the case that. Mm. No, uh, I remember waiting for the TT specials coming in the shops. You always got your TT special yeah. where you went to the presentation, and uh, there would be crowds. That, whether you got it on Broadway, there was a crowd right up around the corner, or down in the Marina Bookshop, Castle Street, near the Rattle Mine. Yeah, yeah. Big crowd along there, and then of course eventually the 
the pay by van would arrive at half past eight, there'd be a big cheer, chuck a big bundle on the deck, and it would be a mad scramble. Because once you got your TT special, which was about what, how much did that cost? About 20p, something like that. Then you could join the happy throng to queue up for the presentation in the villa. Happy times. Brilliant. Um, all right, so A, the lovely producer we have in the background there, he's got some uh, great shots he wants to share with us at the Norton because we do want to bring up some. So the, with the success of the Manx Grand Prix, the they did, well, you boys can share more information on this. We want to touch on the Manx Norton or the Norton Manx. Um, Aid, have we got those pictures there? Any idea what year this is from? God, it's a good it's good folks. Testing your knowledge. Ooh. Yeah, that would be ahead of its time. Mm. Got the, even the back stand is still on it. That is mm. a, it's a, like look at the number 110 in the Manx Grand Prix, and he's riding number eight. Mm. Late forties, I would think it would probably be. That would probably be coming back very, very soon after the war. I would uh, yeah. suggest. I'd say post World War Two. Yeah. But um, before the featherbed came in in nineteen fifty. Yeah, they had all kinds of problems around about that era. I mean, my uncle Jack rode in forty seven, I think, in the Grand Prix for the for the last time. I don't remember it much. Well, I do. I have Oops. been reliably is that the answer? 34. 1934. Is it? Wow. Three more. Oh, well, wow. it just shows how much we, we know. We are absolutely yeah. <laughs> things. We'll get our own back. <laughs> oh, yeah. Brilliant. So, so boys, yeah. if you could, you you know more about the story of Norton. So, Norton have had such a huge presence in the paddock, uh, whether it be TT or the Manx, Manx Grand Prix and the Classic. But they brought in uh, the uh, they brought in their own bike to honour the race, didn't they? Look at that design there. Check out the tash, amazing. Yeah, that's a bit special, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> unapproachable. No? We do know one little story about the the fact that they got them to handle an awful lot better than uh, that. See the see the the setup of the the rigid back end and the and the kind mm. of Stopic folks and the single down tube but there was a fella called rex mccandless whose brother lived on the island crummy and was a tt winner and they spent a lot of time developing what they call the the the, the norton frame the feather bed but how did it get its name i've been reliably informed that uh, the boys brought it over to the island seems hard to imagine doesn't it and whether it would handle better than the previous model and Harold Daniel, I think, was the rider. He was a fellow who couldn't see very far. He was very short-sighted, but, but he, <laughs> God, he could ride quick. And they, they kind of had somebody keeping nicks on the approach from Kregna Bar, somebody keeping nicks from the approach from the 33rd. And they actually tested it out going round Keppelgate and then the big sweeping left-hander that takes you down to the to the Craig, Kate's Cottage. And... Uh, I think it was the remark by Harold Daniel that set the scene for for the the name that they gave it to. And he said, "What's it? What's how does it handle?" He said, "It's like riding on a feather bed." Mm. So the the feather bed Norton was born uh, and stayed. That name stays with us. And then mm. all through the fact of the, the the frame that was developed by Rex McCandless in Ireland. So. Well, wasn't it for many, many years there was always at least one Norton? I mean, up until the early 70s, there were lots of Max Nortons, but for many years there was always at least one turned out in the TT till eventually there wasn't. But the Norton resurged, and there was a lot of political troubles with Norton and financial troubles. But just that race the other year when you had the two Nortons on the road together, Josh Brooks and Dave Johnson on the last lap, we were at Keppel Gate, and you could hear them all the way around the 33rd. Round Keppel Gate, right down to the Craig and down to Brandish, the two of them together. And that was a, a special moment, quite an emotional moment. And mm -hmm. um, Norton's like we know, but it was uh, the, Norton, the last the thing. Name. The last yeah. the last thing. But years ago, I mean, at the Max Grand Prix, especially, the senior race was all Norton's and G50s, wasn't there? Was little else. Yeah, no, same, same thing. Mm -hmm. And then the odd one off, one of the old BSA. Gold Star, 
because again, when you're talking about uh, breeding grounds, they had a clubman's TT for three years as well. And I'll always remember when you think of remembering people easily, you'll never, you would never ever forget the name Bernard Cod, <laughs> Fish Cod, and that was it. And he did the double in uh, what, 56. 56 in the in the, the clubman's TT. Mm -hmm. They were mainly involved with the TT. They did one on the clips course, which I can't remember for some strange reason. I can't remember. Just the one half, I think. And the other ones that we can remember were the ones that were over the mountain course, and they were just pure clubmen. And there's some good footage we've got as well. Like of Eddie Crooks and all them and the boys, they started off in the clubmen's. And they had mm -hmm. a 1,000 CC class as well with Rudge and HRD and stuff and like that. And they had to kickstart those things. And the bike, yeah. didn't fire yeah, by, yeah. the bike didn't fire by the third kick. They had to push through to the pit. <laughs> Very demoralizing. But Barry Sheen's father also raced that. He did, yeah. Frank Sheen, he raced yeah, in Frank the Sheen yeah. rode in the Clubman's. Mm -hmm. And a fellow I did a lot of work with this morning and went on to become a traveling marshal, Goo Owen. He started he his did. career on something that he rode in the winter on trials and scrambles. And then put a load of foam on it and took bits and pieces off it and uh, rode in the Clubman's. That was always the way. And M.L. Max Norton's as well, years ago when they used to drip Norton and used to have these... Big thick carpet, carpet, carpet thing, yeah. <laughs> and soaking the oil. And then when I got soaked up, they would change it for a new thing. Like a bit like you up the cat on a Saturday night. Spreading Manx whispers. Oh, um, yeah. Boys, I just want to ask you one of my own questions before we have to um, close the show, if that's all right. What's your thinking about a classic bike? What's the favorite? Your favourite model that gives you the most buzz when it comes to the sound of it? What would um, be a model on the bike that you would say? Well, you, you're probably going to have to go back to the multi-cylinder bikes of the mm -hmm. 60s, maybe. I, I would say for me the Benelli, Hasselini's mm -hmm. Benelli. And I was only just old enough to remember that. But certainly I, I can remember when I was at Willis School, he had the sports day on the Thursday afternoon of the Thursday afternoon practice, right? And I didn't want to be at the sports day, I wasn't sporty. But you could hear the bikes going round and you could hear the muffled tannoy in the distance and I could hear the Benelli. Now bear in mind that at that time there was no Glen Park Estate, there was no Governor's Hill or right? Cronker Berry, anything like that. It was open fields up to the mountain. And I could hear the Benelli and the MV coming all the way down the mountain. I could tell you which was which. And then I also realised that if you went up to the top corner and you stood on the hedge, you could see the grandstand, you could see the flags waving, and you could see the crowds, and you could hear Peter Neal crystal clear. Mm. And then you, you sort of heard them coming round Bedstead. You lost them in the dip for a bit, and then you hear them go past the grandstand, and I was in raptures. I was only about seven. And I could hear Peter Neal saying who was coming. And the next thing I heard was voice in a different loudspeaker, Barry Wood. Barry, what are you doing up there? Come here. <laughs> it was my egg and spoon race. <laughs> so I had to leave the TT practice and the Benelli and go and do the egg and spoon race. But on the 1968 <laughs> TT uh, DVD, or, or CD rather, it's actually got a uh, uh, Pasolini on the Benelli coming all the way around Kate's Cottage, down to the Craig and right down the street, about 25, 30 seconds worth of the Benelli. That's my mm. The MV was brilliant as well, and the mm. DMVs, I do like travels, but I, I would say Pasolini and Carruthers wrote it in 1969, uh, didn't he? Yeah, he won it. Carruthers won it in He had the Yamaha yeah. in 1970. So they have come back ever since. I did look forward to Dave Robert riding the Benelli in the classic yeah. Manx. Crash that ran cool. He caught a Karamuri car. And it, we yeah. were up on the exit of the Windy Corner. He never got that far. Then I went to visit a friend in hospital that night. Who's in the opposite bed? Dave Robert with Bob <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and what about you, Roy? Yeah, well, we 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 I probably often related the story about uh, the family connection with Uncle Jack and his racing and Park Avenue, and it would be fifty two or fifty three. I think it was Reg Arm when when Reg Armstrong and and Jeff Duke were teammates on the Juliers. And you'll notice pictures of Bob McIntyre's Julia with 
megaphones on on the back. But in that particular year, they found they were more tractable and they had straight pipes. And I got woken up, I must have been woken up. Uh, so I would only be seven or eight years of age to be taken over to the morning practice uh, to get dragged around by Jeff and Uncle Jack. And safely, I must admit, because Uncle Jack, with him being a bit of a film star in No Limit and being a rider as well, he was so well known he could get anywhere. He didn't need a pass if you were with Uncle Jack. And we heard this sound coming down Glen Crutchy Road. And it was just for a young fella of my age, like just not prepared, just like a scream. And if I close my eyes now mm -hmm. and think about where I was on that particular morning, I can hear that sound as clear as a whistle. And I can hear Uncle Jack saying, because Reg Armstrong was tucked in behind Jeff Duke. So you had eight cylinders of open pipes going through the start finish. Fantastic. And mm -hmm. I, just a memory that stayed with me. But then if you if you hear somebody who can ride the Honda 6 properly, not somebody who's just thrown on it to do a demonstration lap, just listen to the likes of Ralph Bryans or Taviri or Halewood or Jim Redman who could ride the, the Honda 6 properly. I think it's quite right, rightly described, as Jeff Cannell called it once, the Japanese national anthem. Mm -hmm. And it's got to be done properly. You could get away with it maybe on the four cylinders, but you'd never get away with it on the six. And uh, certainly those would be the two lasting memories. Jeff Cannell always used to introduce his uh, sports program on Manx Radio with a Honda 6 in the background. And he'd always say only 364 days to the TT. Yeah. And the Honda 6 would be going away on one of the Schofield records somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, it was uh, okay. yeah, memorable stuff. Well, boys, I would, uh, I could listen to you all night. We're going to have to get you back on, aren't we? We've got to. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, what a, couldn't have thought of two better blokes to celebrate or honour this fortnight. That's there's non fortnight that's not coming up, <laughs> but for the classic and the MGP. Thank you, boys, for joining us and sharing your memories and your knowledge. And uh, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. And we look forward to inviting you back on again soon. Hope we haven't uh, scared you off. We're just going to uh, close the show off. We've got um, a video that was submitted by Harold Cosgrove, and it's My TT, 1962 to 1973. We're going to play that out now. Thanks, everyone, for interacting, sharing your comments and your questions. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Yeah, he is. He was a deep support of club rep, wasn't he? Was he? Harold, Canadian, yeah. yeah. One thing that I like is riding around on a motorbike. I'm a speaking when I want to speak in. I want one first prize to win six. I know the dirt track, dirty tricks. I'm a mom when I'm out to win. In a 50 mile race, I am the best. I ride five miles and skip the rest. So come along the CB, riding in the DD races. Easier than hopscotch, beating all the top notch cases. I've been riding all my life, I started quite small. I've ridden ferries, idled iron scooters, and all. Hear the people cheer me when they see me 